She is a holistic beauty professional, skincare educator, and spiritual healing life coach. She's the owner and operator of two brands, The Brow and Boss and Confessions of a Healer, and she's been able to seamlessly bring both businesses together. She specializes in brow, skincare, skincare education, and outside of the salon, she works and assists and mentors women and teenage girls on their spiritual journey to heal. Heal. Brave Hearts community, let's show some love to Coach Cookie. How are you doing this morning? Hi, how y'all doing? I'm so glad to be here. I'm so excited. Yes, had a chance to connect with you on Twitter. We've been connected for a while, but finally got to catch up with you. And yeah. I'm excited about today's segment. Yeah, I'm excited too. I'm super excited. For sure, for sure. Well, let's jump into this because uh, the Brave Arts community is going to be blessed by this. You wrote a blog, by the way. Great blog, by the way. Thank you. Give you Thank kudos you. for that. Great, <laughs> Thank great you. content. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you wrote a blog entitled Promiscuous Girl. And at 11 years old, an older family member told you that you were always being fast. Now, how does that play into the mind of an 11-year-old girl? And how did you process that comment? Oh, so I don't remember how it played into my mind at 11. Yeah. Um, I feel like I probably either ignored the comment physically or, um, yeah, or just suppressed it. Cause it, it really didn't come back up until I started writing and going to therapy, um, in that sense. But I would say as a teen, as a kid, a preteen, a teenager, I feel like, um, I just kind of ignored it. I don't remember reacting. I don't remember how I reacted. Now I do not deal with the family member that often. Um, but I don't remember how I reacted at 11. I don't. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I remember growing up, I, 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 I'm older I'm older than you. I'm, I'm, I'm some years ahead. <laughs> um, but I remember hearing those very things when we were growing up in the neighborhood about the young girls mm -hmm. uh, and stuff like that. And I remember just kind of scratching my head, like, why would they say that? Right you know right and just being a little older i was probably say like if you was 11 i probably was like 15 or something like that you know but just hearing that and seeing how the environment that i know i grew up in and the neighborhood i grew up in when you heard that it was just like oh shoot you know you you almost kind of mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying <laughs> like and you probably tried to stay away from that girl probably yeah, yeah. right yeah. yeah, you probably tried to stay away from her, or if you were a promiscuous boy, you were trying to figure out what she had going on. Um, I know for a, like I still hear to this day. I hear young, I hear people talk about young girls to this day, mm -hmm. and they like, well, she fast or she got too much going on, and you know, you never know what people are dealing with or what they've dealt with. At eleven years old, like I was. <laughs> Even though that I was told that I now I lost my virginity at a young age, but at eleven I had been molested numerous times by people in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and um, it was in like small settings, like guys older than me, in situations where you know I would be with my friends walking around the neighborhood, and uh, one particular situation we were in the pool. And I never will forget that day because we were in the pool and we were kids having fun. And he probably was about 13, 14, maybe 15. And he um, grabbed me underwater. You know, you, you see kids playing in the pool all the time. Mm -hmm. So you don't even think of anything of that nature. But he grabbed me, pulled me underwater and put his hand all the way on my swimsuit. And like I was underwater for a minute. Um, I easily could have drowned had he not pulled me back up. But the crazy thing about that story, where we lived, we lived in an apartment complex, and it was a pool, of course, in the front. My stepdad, he lived, at that time, him and my mom were just dating. They lived, he lived at the balcony above the pool, and they were sitting on the, um, 
balcony having their drinks or you know whatever they were doing and we were just playing and so to this day I get this sensation in my spine from time to time when I'm around certain people and I know then that um I need to be very aware and cautious of that person. Most of the time it's with men and I'm really good with men. Like I can talk to men all day long, but I, I definitely know that if I get that sensation, I'm my body remembers that moment at 11 and 12. So not I me losing my virginity at the age of 12 had nothing to do with me being fast and everything to do with me wanting to protect that in a sense you know like logically in my head it was like if i give it away then it can't be taken away from me so if i lose my virginity and i really don't like to say lose my virginity but if i have sex early if i decide that i want to do it then it can't be taken away from me is that was my logic and of course i didn't really process most of that until i started going to therapy so therapy brought out a whole lot of stuff in me that I didn't even realize I had suppressed or um, forgotten. And I'm still like, still to this day dealing with stuff that I've either suppressed or have come up for me in therapy or even in meditation. I meditate all the time. So sometimes things of visions come back to me and I'm like, oh shit, I forgot. I'm sorry. I hope I didn't, <laughs> I hope I can kiss on you. <laughs> yeah, you're good. No, you're good. We're um, wrong. Yeah, we can. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. I see people say that about young people, young girls, and I really get offended. A lot of times I get offended and I might jump into a conversation like that's not what we're gonna do. Um, and I know that it comes from just being told that by my family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it, it can be very challenging for a young girl to just to go through that stuff and, and like my heart goes out to you and to anybody else who's been through that situation because i i was sexually abused at seven yeah you know what i'm saying so even going to therapy and like you said about unpacking those things because you just like oh shoot where did all this come from you know mm -hmm. once, it, once that door is open or once you start to i use the metaphor of uh the do not cross sign the yellow tape yeah yeah once you cross that tape you know in, in your mind and the stuff that you've been through everything starts to make sense and mm -hmm. you know it, yeah. it it gets heavy and i can also understand why some people choose to suppress yeah yeah you know, um, i did like i said i didn't even realize i had suppressed so much until i started therapy and the first nine months of my therapy was therapy was all fluff like literally i was just dealing with everyday stuff mm -hmm. eventually something occurred um actually i well we'll talk about it but i had a miscarriage and a lot of stuff started to come out after my miscarriage i was just tired um and i started therapy because my grandmother had died in 2015 that was my all i was 28 sorry i was 29 mm -hmm. she died a month before i turned 30 so i really went through um i i went through a depression but more so, I went through an awakening. So I had a dark, dark night of the soul moment. Mm -hmm. And I actually didn't even know what that was until a few years ago. But I remember when her, past, her passing really pushed me into, okay, what the hell I'm going to do now? What am, where am I going now? Because my grandmother was like my everything. That was my bestie. I talked to her on a daily basis. Um, even though I didn't live in the city, I moved here to Nazareth from Memphis. And so even though I didn't live in Memphis, I was always there. Like I went home every other month for two years just so I could spend time with her. Mm -hmm. um, and when I wasn't at home, I was talking to her on the phone. And so my dark night of the soul moment was her past. And I really, after she passed, I had a dream about her and she wouldn't talk to me like and it just devastated me and so then I went into um a state of depression but I it really helped me to understand who I was and who I was becoming mm -hmm. and so I say all the time like my year 30 is when I started to understand me 
and I didn't really understand me before that. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, thirties, thirties are some great years. Yeah, um, you get a lot of revelation. You know, you still you still young, and people start to put some respect on your name because you know, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you lived a little bit. You know that whole thing. So, thirties are are some some great years i know when people transition from going from 20 to 30 they're like oh i'm getting old i'm like no this is really just the beginning you know right you start to get that uh, self-actualization uh and i was also i wanted to say when you talked about getting that feeling up your back that that mm -hmm. yeah because i was reading a book have you read a book called the body keeps the score okay <laughs> that, was, that book was so i tried i started it yeah it's so much yeah. it is so much i started it i have it in my audible i i literally have to go back and listen to it <laughs> yeah. i it was just so much yeah i but and i've been told to read this book numerous times so finally i started it mm -hmm. but it's it's just so much and honestly it was boring yeah <laughs> it was boring to me so i was like i, I but i do want to finish the book yeah, it's it's very dense. Yeah, I I wouldn't recommend reading it. I would recommend just listening to it on Audible. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it's very dense. So when you told me that, it kind of triggered in and, my head. Yeah, somebody, a lot of people have told me that because I talk about that sensation in my spine a lot. Like I'm very vocal now about mm -hmm. my experience in life. Mm -hmm. Um, mainly because I work with so many women as an institution. But also with so many teenagers, they come to me as if I'm their age. And so because they share so much with me, knowing that I'm not their age, I'm able to kind of pour into them in a sense or in a way that parents aren't able to pour into them. So I'm very vocal. I talk to them. I don't know how many times I've been told that they have lost their virginity or just asking me different questions. And of course I try to, I remain and keep boundaries, but I do realize that as a teenager, I would talk to my friends. Mm -hmm. I, and I also taught for a while, I taught sex education. So as a teenager, I would talk to my friends and we didn't know nothing about sex, right? Other than what we had heard or read or whatever. So when they come to me and ask me questions about certain things, I'm able to relay messages to them um, to help them make the proper decision, whatever they decide to do. Because at the end of the day, they're going to do it regardless of whether I say don't do the shit or whether I say <laughs> do it. Like, they're going to do it. Just like we did it, they're going to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So I've, I'm very um, open about my experience um, as far as molestation, as far as having sex, as far as relationships. Um, and just life in general, I'm super open about that. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate that because it's needed um, in, in today's culture. I think we don't talk about it enough. I think you find some pockets, some people, but we we need yeah. to be on a table where we can normalize those things and talk about yeah. our experiences without feeling judged. Most definitely. I'm, <laughs> I grew up in a church. My dad is a pastor. He's a bishop. Um, and him and my mom actually got divorced when I was 11. So a lot of stuff happened between the age of 11 and 12 mm. that honestly, I feel like sometimes I group a lot of that together. Right. Um, but him and my mom, they separated when I was about nine or 10 and the divorce was final at 11 or 12. And so, um, <laughs> being a PK kid, People put this stigma on us, right? And a lot of people don't even know until I say you're my dad's a bishop. Mm -hmm. They don't even know just because of how I am. But I'm no longer a part of the church. Mm -hmm. And this is honestly the first time I've said this on um, a podcast or live, right? But I'm no mm -hmm. longer a part of the church. I, The pandemic really pushed me out of the church. Then I started to really... Um, cultivate my relationship with the divine and really understand why it's important to have a relationship with him or her, however you identify, mm -hmm. um, or them, mm -hmm. and how to have a, um, without being in the church. And so I, I get a lot of stigma from family members about not going to church, of course, <laughs> yeah. but 
I I really came out of the church in 2020. Um, and where was I going with that? Where was I going with that? <laughs> well, well, we here. This is this is exclusive content. So, but I don't know where I'm going. But anyway, so I came out of the church in 2020, and that really opened up the gate for me to really understand and talk about the things that I talk about now. Um, you really, when you told me that you really like my blog, I was like, I have got to be back to writing because I have so much information to share, uh, even down to spirituality, because we, when we see, when we hear spirituality, we automatically think demons and devils and evilness and voodoo and hoodoo, like we automatically think that. And that's of course, because we've been taught that, right? So, and I have some really good conversations with my dad about uh, spirituality. Now, of course, he want me to get back in the church. My mom want me to get back in the church. Yeah. It's not happening. Um, but I still am very vocal about my relationship with the divine. I pray every morning. I write down my prayers. I don't identify the divine as just male or female. Mm. I kind of group them together. I, but I say divine mother, divine father. Okay. Um, so, you know, I do a lot of those different um, things and I, I'm okay with having those spiritual conversations, especially with the kids being so open to so much. Like young people, they see my crystals, they see my <laughs> my necklaces and they get so intrigued. And I have to tell them like, whatever you see on the internet, you have to, you really have to do what you, you have to do the uh, research yourself or work with somebody. And and I also talk to them about, you know, being intuitive. And that's something we don't talk to our young people about. Like when I think about that sensation in my back, mm -hmm. I think about my intuitiveness now. Mm. So I'm very, my body knows this person may not be the safest person for you. Mm. So even if I don't think it, you know, like, because we are really good with seeing people and be like, oh, they're great. But our body and our energy catches that. And like, now nah, they ain't that good. They they got a mask on. Mm. They have a mask on and you're, you're holding on or you have a mask on as well mm. because you're not telling them everything and they're not telling you everything. But guess what? Y'all energy is colliding. Mm. It's not together. And this is why you just got this sensation in your back. Mm. And and who's to say that the person that I'm dealing with doesn't have that time, same type of energy or sensation, and they don't even realize that because they have that, they don't, I'm not the person that they need to be around. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> right, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but me having that sensation, I literally be like, yeah, let me get the hell up out of here. <laughs> <laughs> or I just, I'm really cautious with, how I receive that person. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you this, I don't date anybody that if I get that sensation, and not all the time do I get it, mm -hmm. but if I get it in a moment, and sometimes it's just more of um, just being reminded of that fear that I did have back then. Mm -hmm. So I have to also cultivate and understand that too. Like it may not be that this person is a bad person, but I was reminded of of our interaction. Mm, interesting. That's that's good because um, some people um, don't get into the whole spiritual piece, especially when it comes to people. And I know a lot of times we talk about energy and stuff like that. Like I get it, but like you said, to have that discernment or energy enough to cut somebody off and be like, mm -hmm. this is because some people they ignore it. Mm -hmm. you know they get caught up in that feeling or you know he fine or he's six foot yeah. four and he got yeah. you know he got this and that and they just ignore everything else but I'm glad that you said that a lot of times we do leave out that spiritual peace when it comes to especially when it comes to relationships mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to think because I wanted to ask you what made you leave the church but I think that's another show for another time unless you want to talk I about what made me leave this? I'll talk about it. What made me leave leave the church? Um, I think it was just a it was a, definitely a series of events. Okay. Um, man, church people mean as hell. First of all, <laughs> church people can be so mean, and if you don't believe what they believe, how they believe it, they they 
they will definitely shine you, right? Yes. Um, but so I went from a small church in here in Nashville to a bigger church here in Nashville. And when I went to the church, like I have my I've I've seen posts on my Facebook and you know how it reminds you of stuff, right? Yeah. Where I be I was just so excited to go and be in the name of, you know, in the presence of the Lord. Mm-hmm. And on some nights being like not going anywhere because I got to get up and be in church tomorrow. And I'm just so excited to hear the word. Right. Mm-hmm. And then there were moments. Now I know I put it on do not disturb my bed. <laughs> and then there were moments where um, I just didn't want to be at the church. Mm-hmm. Didn't want to be there. Had no desire to be around anybody or, um, be around the name, didn't want to hear the name, <laughs> didn't want to hear Lord, Jesus, God, didn't want to hear none of that, right? Mm. So I had those ups and downs <laughs> as young as 16, mm. like having those moments where I didn't want to hear his name. I remember getting into it with a girl about her telling me she was going to pray for me, and I told her not to pray for me ever in her damn life. Like, <laughs> I, I remember this, right? I was in college. Yeah. And so then, um, 2020 happened and the viral pastor, um, Michael Todd. Yeah. Yeah. I listened to him. I still listen to him. Right. Mm-hmm. Not every day, but I do listen yeah. to him. He's and so he's really good. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. So I started listening to him more during the pandemic. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah. Um, uh, I remember him one sermon where he talked about the church being a building and you ain't need church. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, that is so true, because I get tired of feeling like I have to be there in order for me to talk to God. Mm -hmm. Um, Or feeling like I got to pay or send my tithes in order for me to be recognized Mm -hmm. by God or be blessed by him. Mm -hmm. And so then I started to really do like my research on where it started. Like, you would hear that. Mm -hmm. Like how the church started and all of that. Yeah. You would hear that, but I'm not one to follow the path. Like I want to read about it. Mm-hmm. So let me go back and read what this means, right? Mm-hmm. And so I started reading about that. And I was like, well, you know, it, it had stopped resonating for me a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to push myself into something that I thought he wanted me to be. And I'm okay with where I am now. Mm-hmm. I have my moments. Of course, like everybody else, but I'm okay with not going to church and being perfectly fine in his presence or her presence by myself. Like, I don't need that. Like, I've been truly blessed over the last two years mm. and been taken care of without paying my time <laughs> yeah. and, and without being in the church. Like, not saying that to whoever does that, that's great. Do whatever works for you. Right. It just wasn't working for me. I was going crazy trying to pay tax because I wasn't making no money. Like, <laughs> if I feel, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. and I also didn't like, I don't like the fear tactic that people give you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You going to hell if y'all go to church. <laughs> Bro, yeah. have y'all been outside? It's 120 it's damn like- degrees. We <laughs> in hell. Like, <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Or yeah. you you going you go only you gonna go to heaven if you do this this and this? Mm-hmm. Who the hell told y'all that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then also knowing that the Bible is a book, it's a great book. Yeah, don't get me wrong, it's a great mm-hmm. book. But knowing that the Bible was written or um, it wasn't written but interpreted by somebody else, so we really don't know what the heck they were saying. Mm-hmm. so even down to that and I say that about books that I read too like books are written by people so whatever you believe in that book is what you believe but not everything is going to be factual Right. and so I look at the Bible like it's a great book it's a great tool I don't read it on a daily so don't mm-hmm. ask me no scriptures <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do, I do read some, you know, I do read some scriptures. I do know some scriptures, mm-hmm. but, um, it's a great, and it's a great tool for your everyday life if that's what you want. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel like you have to be in that all the time in order for you to be recognized and loved by God. That is just not where I'm at. Yeah. And, and you know, and I think the pandemic did that to a lot of people. I think mm-hmm. once the, the the church doors closed, I think 
a lot of people started to um, figure things out for themselves, I guess. You right. Know, instead of being, I, and I use the term grandfathered in the church, you know, that whole thing. Right. People was like, okay, I need to really figure out this thing for myself, opposed to uh, dad or grandma, or, mm -hmm. you know, uncles or cousins when we had to go to church. Now I got to figure this thing out for myself. Yeah. Um, so I know I, I totally hear you because I, I don't, I, I don't, I think the church has even possibly lost some of its power than the way it was back in the day. Um, but I, I, you know, I just wanted to hear your perspective on that because again, the whole pandemic thing shift, everything, everything. I'm glad you, you brought that up for you and your own personal experience. And you know what? I real quick, I was watching the Aretha respect movie last night. Okay. I was, I started watching it and I realized like even down to her, like the movie slick is kind of triggering in certain aspects. Right. Mm. Um, if you haven't dealt with, or it brings some stuff up, but I, it's a segment, it's a section in there at the beginning where she's singing in the church. Her daddy was a pastor mm -hmm. and pastors be so damn hard. Of course, sometimes like my daddy, he, my daddy's really kind of chill. Yeah. My daddy, he was kind of chill. He had his moments, but he real chill. I can talk to him about a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. but her daddy was like super stern, hardcore. Yeah. She had kids before wedlock. I mean, out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. And so I remember him saying to her, you pregnant again? And she had already had two kids. But I remember a section where Jennifer Hudson, that's who's playing her, she was singing in the church. And I mean, baby, baby girl was feeling this song. Yeah. Like, feeling it. And I had that. I looked at it and I was like, man, I remember those days. And then I remember how uncomfortable I felt after those days of singing in the choir or I, I used to praise dance too. I now I love praise the praise dancing, right? I still yeah. to this day praise dance in a different way, but mm -hmm. still giving reverence to God because I know that God is within me, right? Right. But I remember watching it, I was just like, man, and she just looks so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you could tell she was like really singing her heart out to the crowd. Mm -hmm. And then she'll look over at her dad and he looking and he like looking at her because that was his pride and joy. And mm -hmm. so he wanted her to be everything that he needed her or wanted her to be. Mm -hmm. And so she was she just didn't look comfortable. And even though it's a movie yeah. and it's not really Aretha Franklin, I just could feel that energy then. Mm -hmm. And that's what when I think about going to church, that's what I think about for myself, like how uncomfortable I be looking and feeling in that moment, especially now. Like I haven't been back, but I'm going Sunday because my mama begged me to go. And I just been thinking about that. Yeah. Like, God, help me with this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear you. Yeah, because you know, family, they 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 be evangelizing. They're like, you better, you know, you better come yeah. see the floor, you know. But yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> Uh, how do you how do you do you feel that culture has hypersexualized black girls now yes now now let me let me tell you how this worked out this okay. question i was I, I posted on twitter i said and i don't know if you've seen it is there a controversial topic on relationships that no one is talking about mm, I, said, I did not see that yeah i said i said just put it out there you know let's be honest and a guy, he tweeted me this, this question. He was wow. like, let's talk about the over-sexualization of Black girls. Now, my, my wife and I, we always have this conversation, but not publicly because some people can be triggered. Some people, mm -hmm. you know, so we was like, eh, we'll just kind of keep this in-house, but we're going to talk about it eventually. But I wanted to talk to you um, about that as well, especially with reading the blog and you being as, as transparent. So I'm like, Look, it's perfect right yeah yeah this, this was meant to happen so yeah you know. i definitely believe that culture um um hypersexualizes black girls and black women mm -hmm. um why do they do that i don't know but it made me think about sarah her last night started to be i can't remember but she was a slave mm -hmm. and oh, Sarah Bartman. Bartman. Barton, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I seen yes, that. it makes me think about and remember when Kim Kardashian and I I'm very vocal about how I feel about them folks. Can't stand them hoes. But anyway, but 
Kim Kardashian did a picture and it was it was similar to that of Sarah Bartman, right? Mm. When she showed like she had a flower on her ass or something. Now, of course, Sarah Bartman didn't have that. But right. even down to that, Black women have just been hyper or over-sexualized for years. I was like 12, 11, 12, 10, 10, between 10 and 12. Mm -hmm. I was, again, in the same neighborhood I grew up in, right? Mm -hmm. Walking in the neighborhood, in our apartment complex, I lived in Memphis, an apartment's called Cedar Mill. Don't know if they still there because I never go to that part of town when I go home. Mm -hmm. But it was two sides. It was the apartment side and it was the townhome side. So when we first moved there, we lived in the apartments and then over about a year and a half, we moved to the townhome side because mm -hmm. my mama and my stepdaddy got together, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember walking from the townhome side to <laughs> the apartment side to see my friends. We going over to the pool and stuff. And this man, oh man, he had to be like 40. He looked at me and he said, girl, you two stout to be 11. And I was like, and, and Memphis style me thick, you know, got a big booty, whatever. Mm -hmm. And he was like, it ain't no way you, do you know the things that I would do to you? You can't be 11. And this was like almost 40 year old man. He probably was older than that. I just remember seeing him on the bike and looking like a coke can or something. Yeah. But he was serious about it, right? And then being in the neighborhood, still walking around with my friends and the Hispanic men sitting on their cars and just watching us like hawks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just when I think about those moments where I wasn't touched by them, like just their looks yeah. made me fearful. Like, oh, my God, what's going to happen? Or mm -hmm. can I do I can't walk here by myself. Um. And I, and I was so oblivious because, I mean, I was a kid. Right. And so I didn't really understand what I understand now as a grown woman. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, we definitely over-sexualized or hyper-sexualized Black girls. Um, as they start getting big, you know, older, they have breasts. Mm -hmm. and our counterparts don't have the same shit we got. Like, they just don't look like us. You know what I'm saying? And then, so we, we get our breasts. We had a booty, we had the hips, all before the age of 14. And so when we have all of that, people look at us and be like, wow, well, what's she gonna look like at 18? I can't mm. wait till she gets to... A... I actually don't even like older men because of that. Like, y'all, it's nasty, bro. It's just, don't look at me like that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah I definitely think we do. Um, And we try to make it seem like it's okay and it's not. I'm glad you, you said overlook that. It. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because imagine and imagine in today's culture where you have access to Pornhub at, at you know right. on your phone, you're a little right. kid, and, and you have access to like when we were growing up, and I guess I'm telling my age, if I wanted to, <laughs> if I wanted to look at something nasty, I had to make the effort. Yeah, <laughs> I had to, I had to go to a store to buy the magazine or and then, and, and, yeah. And who was going to buy me a, 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 a dirty magazine, right? As a, right. As a teenager, you know, so uh, I had to make the effort, uh, you know, just so many different things. But now kids have so much they can just type it into their phone. Yeah. You know, so I want wonder... And it ain't no, it ain't. <laughs> I just thought about some. The other day I was making a flyer for my um, back to school my back to school event or special. And so I was looking for black teen facials, right? Yeah, when I say I was so, I was so livid, I had to put the phone down for a minute because black teen facials, as I typed it in, I, I'm thinking, I'm not even thinking of what's gonna pop up. Mm -hmm. Pornhub and pictures of black girls with stuff on their face. And I was just, I mean, I was, I was so angry. I was so mad and I was, and at first I was gonna screenshot it and post it, right? Mm. Like this is the bullshit that you can find. But, but if you want to, just go on there and Google. Mm. Google black teen 
facials. Like I literally had to go back in and distinguish black teen uh, facial products or something. Mm. And then I started to see what I was looking for. But at the beginning, it was like, oops. At the beginning, it was like Pornhub. Sorry, y'all. No, you Pornhub good. Pornhub and um, you, you pictures had, of all of that. Yeah, so, you had to redefine your search. To, yeah, yeah. And that, but but when I looked up, when I looked up teen facials, little white girls popped up like with no issue. So that really ticked me out because I was like, I, I've never. Yeah, I was pissed. So yeah, we definitely over sexualize and hype hypersexual and it's not just in our culture mm -hmm. it's not just us that do it it's the it's the caucasians and the other people that do it as well like they look at black girls and be like wow i wonder what that would be like to be with her mm -hmm. and 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 i mean if you think about this what the hell they did in slavery so it's not that <laughs> it's not that we we do it and we do it, of course, but they do the shit too, and they probably do it more than we do. That's true. That's true, and it's it's a it's a sensitive but yet real topic. Mm -hmm. Again, I think we don't discuss enough because, like you said, with young girls today, you know they 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 built, and yeah. Just, be like oh my god you know what I'm saying so and now that I'm older and I have a daughter who's you know she's 19 now right but as a man I'm already knowing how guys think and I'm just like trying to get my daughter on game making sure that I'm you know mm -hmm. trying to protect her and, and this is what you look out for and all these things and, this, and just, sometimes this becomes so exhausting because you like I want you to get this I want to just stuff this down in your head right. get it but they gotta live and learn and you just like, yeah oh my god you know so he's like the struggles of a dad you know yeah uh trying yeah. To, I, trying to... and i work with so many <laughs> i work with so many teenagers like my my little cousin she is 20 and i talk to this girl almost every day mm. and i've been talking to her since she was like 14 mm. and she has shared so much with me and i have shared so much with her um, she's in college now, and I thought, I truly thought that when she went to college, she wasn't going to be the way, I feel like now that she's in college, she's way closer to me now than she was even under 18. I literally, I get, I got a text message from my mom not too long ago, my cousin, and she was like, thank you so much for being a part of her life. Like, thank you so much for helping her in areas that I don't think I could. And so when I get those type of text messages from family members and friends, about that teenagers, I'm like, okay, so it's worth it. Like what I went through in the past is definitely worth what I'm sharing in my in my present and what I'll share in my future. Mm -hmm. Because, and I've already been told that, like I was prophesied, a, a prophet had already told me um, years ago that this was going to be my purpose and my ministry before I even knew that this was my purpose and my ministry. And now that I'm here, I'm like, dang okay this is what the heck they were talking about because of course I was like whatever yeah. but now I'm like yeah and I, I remember seeing it in my dreams but I didn't understand it of course mm -hmm. and so then when they confirmed it and I was like okay now I'm living it and I'm like wow that's really exactly what mm -hmm. that's what I needed that's yeah. definitely what I needed to mm -hmm. know before you know people want to know their life before they see it of course but we don't always believe that but i'm glad that i kind of even i was like okay whatever i'm kind of glad that i was like yeah whatever but understood that i did have a purpose mm -hmm. on my life mm -hmm. yeah that's <laughs> yeah that's powerful and, and you know another thing too because i thought about growing up in the 90s and, 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 you know, the hip hop videos and the video vixens and, you know, I, that was that was my era, you know, so uh, the music, because uh, even some music I listen to now, I, I love, and I'm not blaming it all on hip hop because I love hip hop, love, I'm born and raised right. on it, but there are songs that even if I listen to today, I'm like, I can't believe I was repeating them lyrics <laughs> at, at, at 13, like, I was really listening to that right and, and, and got the words down packed in my head here i am grown as can be today listening to the <laughs> listen to the song i'm just like 
Oh, wow. Man. Right. Yeah. Like, I yeah. can't believe it. <laughs> you know, so. And it's worse now. They crazy now. Like, I have heard some stuff and been like, yeah, let me just cut this off because I don't even need this in my spirit. I don't even need this in my spirit. I don't need this in my energy. But the 90s, the 90s was lit, first of all. Lit, for real, for real. And if I could go back to any era, it yeah. would be the 90s. The 90s is the coldest. Um, And I'm sure other people, you know, of course, older people, they probably feel like that about a time in their life. But the 90s, and I wasn't even old enough to to really be in the 90s, right? I was yeah. like, in 95, I was 10. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, but it's that when I think about it, like my daddy, so in the 90s, we lived, of course, in Memphis, mm -hmm. and my mom and my daddy bought a house with a pool. Mm -hmm. So we was like the uppity Negroes of our family, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. We had a pool in the back, a big-ass house. Um, all that. My dad was a nurse. My mom, she did, uh, I forgot what, she was like an accountant or something. Mm -hmm. And so we had a nice house, a nice house, big pool. They used to have pool parties every weekend. Yeah like no other mm -hmm. on top of the fact my daddy was a minister but mm -hmm. my daddy was cool as hell like yeah. when i think about him and how cool he was like he would just he would just they just always had stuff going on mm -hmm. and me and my daddy really have a very rocky relationship yeah. but i'm very open about how he was back then when i think about how he was back then up until him and my mom got divorced and separated when they separated and divorced life got rocky for us mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, of course now and i just had this conversation with him but of course now i realized he was in his 30s he was dealing with his own emotions she was dealing with her emotions mm -hmm. so um they had to deal with that shit they still yeah so I, I forgive both of them but me and his relationship with rocky but he was cool as hell <laughs> and so they would have these dang out parties and I remember listening to um, he used to play this song, and I feel like they played it at every damn party. It was um, I don't remember the name of, it, but it's like, do you want to ride in the back seat of my? Oh yeah, do it. You know that one. And it was another one called White Horse. Yeah, do you want to ride? Yeah, that one. And then it was another one called. Yeah. Started. Listen, but those are my favorite songs. Like, and when I listen to them now, like. Why was I listening to that at that age? <laughs> yeah. Those two, it was that. It was a song called White Horse. And then, what's the dude's name? Is it Teddy Riley? All I want to do is a boom, 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 mm -hmm. and a zoom, zoom. 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 Just shake Don't the rum. Listen. The rum shaker. <laughs> yes, rum shaker. Like, them three songs, you can play those songs now and to this day. And yeah. I'm, I'm jigging. You turned Just up. because... <laughs> I remember from back in the day, but like my daddy, them would be so lit. They mm -hmm. would be so lit in the backyard on the patio. Yeah. Chilling. Yeah. The kids swimming. Mm -hmm. Like life was great. <laughs> I remember those days. Those, yeah. that's, that's classic all day. I remember those days. The barbecues and the friends yeah. and family. Family turned up, everybody drinking. And when black folks love being black, but they ain't have to show that they love being black. Mm -hmm. Like they literally just like now we and i'm i'm not against us showing our love for ourselves no i hear you yeah. but back then it was like it was we it was, black it was a, <laughs> yeah we it was a different yeah. different era for sure yeah uh when did you break free from the judgment about others being sexual as a woman about 30. it was probably about 30. 30 is some good years <laughs> yeah i turned 30 and i was like man i don't give a damn which i think and so I, again, I lost my virginity at 12. My mama found out. I went to Planned Parenthood and got my big sister. To, I had, I did the big brother, big sister program. Mm -hmm. And my big sister, she took me to Planned Parenthood when I was 12 to get, 12, yeah, 12, to get um, birth control. Mm -hmm. And so I had them, because at that age you could go, now I don't know how it is now because of, all the stuff that they just did. But at that age, I was able to go without a parent. <clears throat> and so my mama found out I had lost my virginity, of course, through finding my birth control. Mm -hmm. And she 
she was pissed, right? Yeah. So she was so mad. She made me feel so bad. She told me how disappointed she was in me. All those things, of course, not knowing that I did this because of what had happened to me before. And she didn't learn that until I was 30 and going to therapy. Mm. But um, she um, she told me how disappointed she was in me. Yeah. And from that age, I don't know, until I was probably like 20 some, I just wanted her to trust me again. Mm. So I became, it, it became me pleasing her. So doing whatever I could to get her on my side for mm. her to understand and trust me. Right. Mm. And so, um, and so I would share stuff with her. Like she, my mama, she asked me questions still to this day. Mm. And I tell her now, I be like, girl, don't ask her dang on questions you don't want to answer to. <laughs> like if you don't want the real life answer, then don't ask me Yeah, because I'm going to tell you. But that's because I legit told, I would tell her stuff back in the day. Like when I, after my, after she found out about me um, having sex, mm -hmm. you know, of course I wanted her to know or trust me. So I would just share anything with her. Yeah. And so, but she didn't ask me some of the stuff that she has asked me in the previous years. But after so long, I've just decided like, I can't listen. I'm a sexual being. I like to have sex. That's what that's what it is, mom. Mm -hmm. So you just don't now you in the church and you celibate because she no longer with my my aunt, my um stepdaddy. So you live in your life however you want to be living your life. I'm gonna live mine how I want to live mine. Yeah. And so now if I get to the pearly gates of heaven, if that's where we going, <laughs> if we go there and he asks me about him, tell him too. Like I'm not. <laughs> I just, I'm not, I didn't wash my hands with how people feel about it. Yeah. Because you. if we gonna be honest, all of us is having sex. Mm -hmm. I, most of us is having, and the ones that's not, more power to you. Mm -hmm. That ain't where I thrive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's just not where I thrive. And because I don't thrive there, I'm not gonna sit there. Mm -hmm. So if you thrive in celibacy, do your thing. If you thrive in sex, do your thing. If you thrive in being up and down, whether you celibate one week, and then, you know, you decide that you want to go out here and do whatever the hell you decide you want to do. If that's where you thrive, do your thing. But do not allow other people to tell you that because you live your life like this, it's a sin, it's an abomination, and all of those things. Because you got your relationship with your divine creator, and that's what matters the most. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was probably about 30. Mm. Yeah, like I say, 30, 30s are some, some good years because Laura knows I, you know, I see, yeah, let me just be honest. See, I, I didn't, I really didn't get a chance to because I wrote a blog or I did a YouTube video called Should I Have a Whole Phase After Divorce, right? Mm, yeah. as, a, as a man. Yeah. But, but for me, my convictions was I'm like, I have a daughter. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm going through this divorce. Here it is. I'm 40, right? Was with mm -hmm. the same woman for 15 years. So wow. Yeah. So I was married for 15 years, never cheated. You know, not like I want a cookie or anything, but I was just right. with one woman, you know, for 15 years. And but that was the common thread that people would tell me is like, hey, get out here and experience some things and stuff like that. But just because of my own convictions, I was like, uh, I got a daughter to raise. I don't want her to see, you know. So I'm like battling with myself and stuff like that. But ultimately for me, it, it all paid off because I was able to remarry and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, and I ain't dead, you know what I'm saying? So I'm right. like, but my own conviction was just was like, nah, like, huh, you gonna mess around, get somebody, you gonna get somebody pregnant, you gonna yeah. get the STI, you <laughs> and yeah. I'm just like, I'm good. But right. that was just from, from my conviction. But the conversation, like I said before, it was just a lot of people was like, hey, you go ahead and get to do this. And I was like, uh, uh. so it's just that yeah. thing for me personally. Um, so that's why I asked you that question because I was like, to be able to have that freedom and just be like, I don't care what you Negroes think. I don't care. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? There's freedom in that. Yeah, it, that's why I said wherever you thrive, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I do not, I don't really care which what people decide to do with themselves. Yeah, right? I'm very pro-choice, mm -hmm. and that's in life in general. Like whatever you decide to do, mm -hmm. do that, mm -hmm. but be the best at it. Shit, do it. <laughs> whatever you decide to do. So, like, um, I, I, <laughs> I feel like. 
because I remember, you know, they talk about in college, even in college, they would talk about people having their whole phase in college mm -hmm. and then people having their whole phase after they get out of relationship. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's always talked about from a woman's perspective. Right. Not ever is it really talked because honestly, people just believe men are hoes in general. And I have to tell people that too, like, it's the men out here that is really not living the life that you want to portray them to live. Like mm. that really some the some, the men that you, we talk about or the men that we meet, not all of them live. Like you said, you didn't have did you have a whole phase or no? I didn't. My I, So yeah. And, and you ain't missing nothing that you ain't had. Like and, you ain't got to And and I was gonna ask you to I was gonna ask you to break that down because I was listening to you talking and I was like talk about that a little more because for men i think and correct me if i'm wrong i what i'm hearing you saying is is that basically are you saying that men are hoes by nature or are you saying that that's what people portray oh, that's okay. what people gotcha. believe mm -hmm. no nah, men ain't hoes by nature i think that it it really depends on your life it really depends on how you grew up it really depends on what happened to you you know how some young you see in the movies or shows where a little girl and broke a little boy heart and now he then just became a savage, mm -hmm. right? But then you also had those little boys that they got their heart broke and now they like, what can I do to be a better person for the next person? So like, we have stigmas on everybody, women and men. Yep. And, we, and that's why we have the battle of the sexes. Mm. And then we have the battle of, the, like, especially in our community, black women against black men and black men against black women. And she don't need to wear her hair like that. That ain't how I want my wife to be. That ain't how I want my husband. Like, all of the stuff that we do, like, we literally are planning to the role that people have put out there for us. Mm -hmm. So... I'm not saying, cause I really, I know some, I know some amazing black men who never had those. Like they, they just, that ain't the life they wanted to live. Cool, buddy, do your thing. <laughs> I had, I know some amazing women that that's not the life that they wanted to live. Then, and I also don't really care for the whole, I don't really like titles. So ho phase and all those different, like I really, even though I can talk about them, I don't like titles like this. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I used it. I used it as a. I, I think I used it as more of a catch phrase, like so people knew right. what I was talking about. You know what I'm saying? That's so. But I people that. still tell you that they'll be they'll be like, <laughs> she going through her whole phase now, <laughs> or they'll say, uh, uh, he he just he been a hoe. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. they tell tell you that. So so I don't really care for those negative titles. Yeah, I don't care for titles in general, but. Um, just those negative titles are just, you know, we when we think about our people, we'll say those things and be yeah. like, they going through whatever they're going through. But at the end of the day, now they're just dealing with themselves, how they want, they learning who they are. So mm -hmm. if being sexual is who you are, be your best at it. Like, mm -hmm. or being non-sexual, just be the best or the greatest. Yeah, right. It's just the conversation. I follow Justin. Do you follow Justin LaBoy on, um, on Instagram, I, like, I, do you ever see the memes? I yeah, I seen some of them. Yeah, the name is yeah familiar. Yeah, so he posted something the other day, and I can't remember a hundred percent how it went. But when I was reading the comments, because sometimes I just go read the comments because people funny. Yeah, and they were talk. Women was on there talking about being celibate, and I'm like, that's great. <laughs> but when we start having those conversations, we make people feel bad about what they decided to do. But even down to people that have sex and when they talk about not being celibate, you make people feel bad about not doing it. Mm. So it's like, just mind your damn business and do whatever you do. Right. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Because whatever you choose to do is, that's your business. Yeah. That's, that's your and body. You it ain't going to heaven, you got to talk to God about it anyway. <laughs> if you go going to the palace gate, he is not going to ask you about the next person. He's going to ask you about yourself. Yeah, right. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, and I tell people, you know, that's your body. It ain't mine. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, that's, and so whatever you decide to do. Mm -hmm. And everybody's experiences are different. I wanted to, um, I wanted to discuss about the you wrote the letter uh, to my unborn. Yeah. And it, it was very touching. And I have a heart for that. I mean, granted, I'm not a woman, but you know, it's just like, mm -hmm. like, how did you get through it? 
And 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 what advice can you give to a young lady who might be experiencing what you've been through? So do you mean how did I get through the letter or did how did I get through the miscarriage and everything? Um both. Okay. Yeah. So how did I get through the miscarriage? Mm. Therapy. Okay. <laughs> like therapy really helped me again. Therapy really helped me to understand myself a little more. Um, at night, at 24, I was diagnosed with, um, a disease or illness called PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Mm -hmm. And so they don't give you much information about that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing my doctor said was lose weight. If you want to have a baby, I was 24. At that time, I was a party promoter, and I was making some good little money in college and working a full-time job. So now, girl, I don't want no damn kids. Right now, I ain't doing all this. So she just told me to lose weight, mm. and you will be able to have a baby. Mm. So I didn't think about that. Well, at 20, 29, or 30, mm. uh, 30, mm. 30. 30 years old, I got pregnant and um, I didn't even know I was pregnant. Like I, I, at that time I worked in a salon with older women. And so that particular, the week, a month before I got pregnant, let me start there. A month before I got pregnant, I had a dream that I had had a miscarriage in my new apartment. And so I woke up and I actually wrote it down. Like I wrote my dream down because it was just so vivid it was yeah. so vivid and colorful and I seen so much mm -hmm. and so I wrote it down and I actually put it on Facebook in this private women's group I was in and the girls in the group was like well maybe that happened to somebody that lived there prior to you I had only been in that apartment like two three weeks and I was like nah this was too vivid like this was way too vivid mm -hmm. and it was me and so I had the dream went on about my business a month later, I was hey, I went to the I had been spotting the whole week, right? And I hope I don't want to be so graphic, but I had been spotting the whole week. Mm -hmm. And that Friday morning I woke up and I was having my miscarriage. I went into <laughs> crazy. Mm -hmm. I still went to work that morning. Still mm -hmm. went to work even after I had had vis vividly had this this miscarriage. I still went to work. I went into the shop and when I walked in, the lady, my friend, my uh, receptionist at the time, she was like, hey, Cookie, um, such and such was in here the other day and she asked me, were you pregnant? Mm -hmm. And uh, she was like, nah, she ain't pregnant. <coughs> and she was like, uh, she don't know, but she is. It was an older lady. And mm -hmm. so I was like, what? And so that made me say, well, let me take my ass to the hospital because I just had this whole situation at home and how I had it in the dream. Of course, I didn't think about that dream then, mm -hmm. but how I had it in the dream is how it happened in my house that morning. And so the only thing about it in my dream, I seen the, I seen the face of the baby. I seen the face. So nothing can tell me that this baby wasn't a boy. Like I seen a little boy. I seen the face of a little boy. Mm -hmm. in my dream and so um I went to the hospital that experience was so dark and so painful mainly because it was a white male doctor and he really had the white it was a white male doctor and a white a female nurse mm -hmm. had that white nurse not um like she had my back mm -hmm. basically because he was like ain't nothing wrong with you and so they did a urine test and it came back negative. And I was like, nah, that's not. And so, but I had been spotting the whole week. And so she fought for me and was like, no, let's do a blood test. And the blood test is what confirmed mm -hmm. that I had indeed had a miscarriage and then was pregnant. And so when I think about that day, it was December 8th. After I left the hospital, I went home. They told me not to go to work. I went to work anyway. I was working at Amazon. Mm -hmm. I still went to work for that weekend, but I took off for like a week or two after. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't, 
the guy, he came over, he talked to me, um, and I still hadn't really processed it, but I also didn't like how he handled me. Mm. And so I distanced myself from a lot of people. I, I just distance myself. And the one thing I talk about, I have not did a blog about it, it is postpartum after miscarriage. People don't talk about that. Mm. After you have a miscarriage, and I've experienced two, mm. um, people don't talk about the pain, the agony, the mental stress and exhaustion you go through mm. after that. Because you're not, you know, people who have postpartum after having a baby, that's one demon that I don't know about. Like that's one beast that I just know nothing about. But what I can speak on is the women who have had miscarriage, especially when they have multiple and the things that they think about when they deal with their body. Mm. So after I had my miscarriage, one thing, like I really was like, well, my body has failed me. Like, and I had it twice. And so I went through those emotions two times the second time i was a little i was better at understanding what i was dealing with mm -hmm. but the first time i was just like well shit, i just gotta keep going i gotta keep pushing and mm -hmm. so i distanced myself from people but it pushed me again that was another dark night of the soul that i had mm -hmm. where i really pushed myself into my healing i remember listening to and he's so big now i'm so happy and proud of him because he wasn't this big then lingerie he's mm -hmm. um he's a poet or artist and he does a lot of different songs and um poems to music right mm -hmm. and so i remember listening to him and his one particular song can't remember the name of it but he was like basically saying, go dance to Sade. Go dance to Sade and Erica Badu. And I legit will walk, run around my house and dance around my apartment to those different women. And it was just so healing, just so mm. healing. And that's when I really started to understand my healing process and understand myself. And, and, and a lot of other stuff came up. Mm. And I knew then that, nah, you can't, you couldn't have had a baby in this moment. Mm -hmm. You couldn't have done, you couldn't have been a good mother to this child because of everything that you had been suppressing in the past mm -hmm. or everything that you had been through. So when I wrote that letter, it was a thank you because it brought me to, and see, I get emotional about that, but it brought me to who I am today. Mm -hmm. And so I did write a letter to my second um, unborn, but I reverence both of them because they both, help me in a manner that like nobody else could help me N neither nobody else could have brought me to the space i am today and i still desire to have kids but i'm a phenomenal auntie um i have a biological niece and i have so many nieces and nephews my god sister has three kids I'm always with them. They call me, they talk to me all the time. My biological niece, she FaceTimes me every day. Mm -hmm. So like, even though I'm not a parent in that sense, I'm still able to, I get to watch my babies. Yeah. Look, the, they don't want you to do this, but I get to watch my babies grow up. So yeah. um, that letter, it really helped me to close out what I did desire. Mm, I love that. Thanks for your uh, transparency. I, I appreciate that. That's You're welcome. such a topic that really needs to be discussed more often. Cause I, and, and, and I just want to say like, especially for, for black women, cause I'm, I celebrate black women. I love black women. My wife is black. My mom is black. My daughter, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So I just, um, wow, this is powerful. I just want to, First of all, just let me acknowledge you for your transparency. Thank uh, you. I want to acknowledge you for being an awesome aunt. Thank uh, you. You know, and and influencing those that you've been entrusted with. Um, I want to acknowledge you for those things and just being who you are, uh, being genuine and being able to share your story because Lord knows how many of our young ladies need that you know not the older i won't say older but you know people who are older than them mm -hmm. they need us you know yeah they need you you know so yeah 
uh, hey, I want to acknowledge you for those things. And I hope you get right back into the blog because <laughs> Thank you know, you. We, we need some more cookie chronicles. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> and I got a lot of. <laughs> yeah. So this has been an exclusive because I felt like you shared so much. Well, thank you. I appreciate. I really appreciate being out here. I was really excited. Mm-hmm. Of course, I was a little nervous, but I was super excited to um, to just be able to share. Like, um, I'm, a, I'm such a sharing person. So I know that I understand and know that what we go through is not just for us. Mm-hmm. It's for other people, too. So if you don't share it, then people can't learn from it. And then you can't be mad because people didn't learn because they weren't going to learn if I didn't share it. Mm-hmm. So much wisdom in this. Coach Cookie, let everyone know how they can get in touch with you on social media. All right. So I am on Instagram, uh, cookie underscore kisses. That's cookie with a K. K K-O-O-K-I-E underscore underscore kisses. K-I-S-S-E-S. And Twitter is the same thing. Cookie underscore kisses, but add a one. Mm. And um, Facebook is cookie kisses. Mm. So... Awesome, awesome. And uh, you want to shout out your business and and what you got going on with your business? Yes, I am a licensed esthetician and a wellness coach. So wellness coach with Herbalife. I work with you on taking care of your skin from the inside out. So of course we work on the inside with your nutrition and I work on the outside with your skincare. So even if you're not in Nashville, even if you're not in Nashville, you can still reach out to me and I can work with you and help you get on some good products for your skin. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, my business is the Brow Boss Studio, um, where I specialize in skincare and brows. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'll make sure I have that information linked up in the description on the video and then also for the podcast as well. So yes. <laughs> everyone go see coach cookie and make sure you show her some love if you are watching this video make sure you hit the subscribe button share this with someone because you never know who needed we always smiling on social media but you never know what goes on behind closed doors and somebody's video can help set somebody free if you are listening to this via podcast make sure you hit the subscribe button make sure you leave a rating and review we'd love to hear from you that puts you in the uh, uh drawing for a free amazon gift card so make sure you leave that rating and review as well this has been a powerful show this is sean heineman your premier pre-engagement coach with special guest cookie kisses <laughs> <laughs> all right people <laughs> take care bye